Class, good morning. I'm glad to see you today. I hope that you're all safe and sound in your homes and that you're in your pajamas or your comfortable clothes and, and um, that you're enjoying your time with your family. Yesterday, I tried to record this and I got so frustrated and I couldn't figure out, you know, what do I need to do differently? And it wasn't the technology side of it for once. It was actually, I felt like I was just going on and on and on. So what I'm going to try to do today, and I want you to give me some feedback on what you think, is I'm just going to go through the narrative and try and, and not worry about saying every single thing that's on my paper. And then I'm going to send you sort of um, an outline as a PDF. And uh, that's a lot of work to do for each lecture, but if, but if you think it would help you, let's, let's, I don't mind doing it. And also, if you want to try Zoom, we can. That's not my first choice, but if you want to try that sometime, we can do it. Uh, this, the recommendation has come has been that you could do during regular class hours. So you just tell me what you want to do. I apologize for this glare on my glasses. I don't know how to fix it. I've moved the lamp. I've closed the curtains, but um, just forgive me on that. And I, can, I have to have my glasses to see, so I apologize. I might try a different location next time. Today, what I want to do is to begin by answering the question that we had at the close of your reading assignment that you had for Richard I as we transition from Richard I into John. And I think even as short uh, as John's reign is, I'm going to divide this into two parts. And I won't always do that with each monarch. But my goal is to have a lecture for every day, and then you can listen to them at your leisure. But um, we'll try to have another one for tomorrow, and I want to catch up with that a little bit so we can get where we're going for this semester. But one of the questions that I had you answer is, you know, who did Richard name as his successor and, and who should have been named? He named, of course, John, his youngest brother. He should have named, by the way, succession is figured today, an inheritance of royal titles. He should have named Arthur, who was the son of his middle brother, Geoffrey. And um, things history would have might have been so very different had Arthur been named rather than John. Uh, the, but now the way Richard made his choice was more in keeping with that Norman and Angevin way of doing things. So he wasn't that out of whack by their standards to do it, just by the way inheritance is figured today. It's sad to me that England missed the opportunity to have <clears throat> another King Arthur. But anyway, uh, going forward, King John is universally considered to have been the worst of the English kings. I think there's some, I apologize, I keep looking at my phone. Um, I will... I'll turn it over. I don't want to, I don't need to know. But um, I think there are some others who may be a challenge to that. But John is nevertheless one of the most important kings by our figuring, not because of the good things that he achieved, but because he was such a bad king, there were some important changes that were made that that I think further defined both the English tradition and charted the course for their history or their future. Um, John is one of those figures like Mary Lincoln, and let me explain what I mean by that. With Mary Lincoln, every few years a new biography comes out, and what what is happening is the biographer or the historian is trying to to rethink Mary, and in the opposite from the deconstructive tendencies what we've talked about, they're trying to say, well, let's look at Mary again. Maybe there's something good we've missed. There's some got to be some reason that Abraham Lincoln loved her so much. And you can't re you can't revive her character. There's a closer inspection just brings you more reasons to go, oh yeah, well yeah, she was difficult, wasn't she? And I think the same has been true of King John. There's been <clears throat> revisionists have instead of trying to tear him down, have tried to go back and look and see. Well, maybe he wasn't all that bad. But when they look, they find out yes, in fact, he was all that bad. So any anyway, that's where we go from here. And and I I think uh, I think. Uh, Professor Frazier in our book, I think she's pretty even handed, but she can't, she still can't find anything. There are all kinds of stories out there and I don't know how anecdotal they are or how, how his, you know, the historicity of these stories, but he, he had a reputation for being extremely cruel 
and mean-spirited and slothful and undisciplined, everything a king should not be. But having said that, I want you to understand that the Norman and Angevin kings were all, every single one of them, fearsome men who inspired terror in the hearts of their own subjects. And, you know, when your own subjects fear you more than someone across the channel, I think that's significant. <clears throat> Just like we tried to say that Richard wasn't an aberration and so weird because he was off crusading. That was the, the order of the day. It's not a lot to say that John was cruel because most of these kings were cruel. And so, well, Miss Justice, what you, you said in one of our last lectures that Henry II was a great king. He was a great king, but he was also fearsome and his his people feared him and and there was a sense of dread about them. So please understand that yeah, you know, yeah, John was cruel, mean and a jerk, you know, all our 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 bad adjectives and synonyms that we can apply, but that was the order of the day. And we can, you know, till we go back to Edward the Confessor, who was not um in the cut in the tradition of his cousin William, you know, these Norman and Angevin's class are formidable men who understand that they are ruling um, in a nation that is at the very least somewhat hostile and at the very worst wants to see that line finished. So there's a lot of different things going on here that that if we have some understanding will contribute to our complete picture of these men. Now, uh, again, I'm not going to get bogged down like I did yesterday trying to do this. I want to just go over some things with you, and I want you to tell me in your feedback if, if I'm going too quickly or if I'm you know, rambling too much. And I'm going to try to back this up with some solid notes. I miss having my board to write on and being able to sort of give us um, points on the to connect, dots to connect. But um, let's go through some of the things about John that I want you to understand, and then this will help my auditory learners, and then we'll go back and, and you'll have something to actually read in addition to your book so you can see sort of where I, I'm, I'm going with this. Historians have, have described John as having three chief error, eras sorry, of difficulty. He had difficulty with uh, Philip Augustus in France, difficulty with the church, specifically Pope Innocent III, and then difficulty at home with his barons. And today, in this first lecture, what I want to talk about is his difficulty with Philip Augustus and his difficulty with the church. And then on the next lecture, we'll talk about the, the domestic problems that he has and then what comes out of, out of those. First of all, dealing with Philip Augustus, it's wrong to pigeonhole his problems with Philip as saying they occurred at the beginning of John's reign because they occur the whole time he's king. Philip is like, he, uh, he is like a spider in a web and he is always spinning and he is always waiting for a chance to pounce and he will ally himself with anyone that is convenient or expedient to his own growth as a king. Now having said this I want you all to understand that Philip Augustus who came to be Philip II is considered to be one of the great French kings and um, let me say let me not even segue. Segue means you're connecting. Let me backtrack a second. I want to say this to you, and if I have before, forgive me, but I want you to understand that a characteristic of modern Europe, and we'll see this when we get in the class in the fall together, a characteristic of modern Europe is the creation of the modern European state, as opposed to these unwieldy, amorphous empires. Empires are going to prove themselves to be the rotary phone of, of Europe. They are the old guard. And, and you say, well, Miss Justice, you just told us that Europe still thinks of itself as part of the Roman Empire. Yes, that's true. And you have the Holy Roman Empire that's functioning. Um, and you have 
the, the idea of rebuilding an empire. Yes, yes, that's going on. But what's going to happen first and is, is the beginnings of the creation of the modern state with limited borders, maybe some holdings for trade and, and um, mercantilism somewhere else, but the idea of this huge continental expanse in terms of an empire is old news. It's old news. And Philip, let me say this for him, Philip lives in France. But France, as we understand it, is still a nation that's in the making. France had been comprised of all these little nation states, or little, not nation states, all these little dukedoms, Normandy, Aquitaine, um, oh gosh, um, Brittany. And then you had the king of the Franks, who becomes the king of France. And this territory becomes the centerpiece around which the modern nation state is going to be built. And Philip understands that. And he wants the English out. I want them out. I want them to stay on their side of the channel. I'll come over there and conquer them. They'll be a vassal state completely. But I don't want any more of their claims over here. And he's going to realize that goal to a limited extent with some of his interactions with John. And one thing, one thing that you have to understand is both England and France, and I know I've said this to you before, both England and France think they can be a one king, two state deal, that you'll have one king who will control both places. And it ain't going to happen. Henry V did not get that memo, and he is going to fight the Battle of Agincourt against the French and come up with a treaty as a result of his victory where his son is going to be king of England and France. And it never works. It never happens the way they see um, that it, it's going to happen. It doesn't work. And it is not meant to be. The peoples are too different. The cultures are too different. And even today, imagine what would happen if you, if you, if you had one government that's why the EU didn't work. And here's why I really am I'm changing, um, or chasing rabbits, rather. Let me go back to Philip. Philip II is smart. He's cunning. He's a liar. He is the flower of the Machiavellian king. Um, you know, we're, we're a little way ahead of uh, Niccolo here. And, and, but he, he, he listens, he pays attention, and he looks for a moment to strike. He forms phony alliances that he sees going to benefit him. He was friends with John against Richard until Richard's dead. Now John's the man and he is going to, to flail against John. He forms a relationship with uh, Arthur. You should have been king. You should have been king, not John. But it's all to undermine John. And John is does not. Uh, John plays right into his hands. So. Um, if you read your book, you'll get a better understanding of how some of this unfolds. I want to tell you um, a little bit about some of John and Philip's interactions. And I think John thinks he can go over and stake a claim in some of these territories or dukedoms, become, you know, use Normandy, use Brittany as footholds to to recapture and, and establish the English presence there and sooner or later run Philip out. And um, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Some of, uh, some of John's interactions come from his personal life. And let me just walk you through this a little bit. We're dealing from about 1199 to around 1205 in those early years of his reign. John has um, John has his first wife, his name Isabella, and their marriage is childless. John has fathered children illegitimately, so he figures Isabella is the problem, and he has that marriage annulled. That's no big deal. You don't have to behead them. You don't have to go through sticky kind of uh, divorces like Henry VIII did. But you're going to have a situation where he annuls the marriage and he has another wife in mind. And her name is also Isabella, Isabella II. 
She is a French lady, a French girl. She's very, very young. She is already betrothed, which was not unusual. She is already betrothed to a French nobleman named Henry or Henri. And he, he and she both control a vast amount of lands in France. And our King John thinks that he can, through this marriage, not only he's she's supposedly very beautiful and John was um, supposedly completely enchanted with her. She's very young, and I mean very young. By some some standards, she was 9 or 10. By others, she was 13 or 14. She was very young. And um, I don't know, you know, we can go all day and say, well, that was older than, I don't know. Um, but he, John is enamored with her and enamored with the lands that he would inherit as her spouse from her. And, and he announces his intentions to do this. And Philip, you know, says, well, I can't believe you're going to, you're going to disinherit. I mean, I'm so sorry. You're going to um, break this betrothal that she has with Henri. And if you're going to do that, then you have to uh, make sure that you renounce any claims that the two of you have to her land. And, and Philip knows that's not going to happen. So this is a chance. Philip sees he can get John to fight in France, lose, get, you know, get his clock cleaned. He says to Arthur, you come on over, assert yourself. I'll support you as king of England. You two duke it out. And the result is, unbelievably, John initially wins in France in this battle for Isabella's hand in her lands. He defeats Arthur and will actually, by some accounts, chase Arthur into a house and kill him with his own hands. Other accounts say that he he had someone do that, but he kills, I mean, Arthur's dead by one, one um, means or the other at John's behest. John wins this battle, but then will turn around and lose in continuing fighting, will lose Normandy and other territories and have to go home to England with Isabella II. They have children. She is so much younger than John that she outlives him significantly and will, in a real you moment, sorry to say that, in a real, in a moment like that, will marry the son of her original betrothed and have quite a few children with him. So it's a real, as the world turns, situation. But John loses men, loses battles in this struggle with, with Philip in France. He begins the process of losing some of the key lands that the English still held over there and future lands that they might have held through this marriage. But he manages to come back victorious in, in acquiring this wife and victorious in the fact that any potential usurper to the throne and the personage of Arthur is now gone. So the first part of his the first part of his um, reign is tied up in these battles and all this intrigue and getting a wife. And there's a lot of discussion out there about what kind of marriage they had. She had him bewitched. I think he. He, she was apparently fairly difficult herself, so you had two difficult people, um, as my husband says, you know, sparing the world from marriage to either one of them, um, saved another spouse for either one of them, but um, some say their marriage was difficult, others say he was completely captivated by her and did not run around on her the way he did his first wife, so I don't know, we, you know, we won't know this side of heaven, and then we won't be worried about it. Um, but once he returns home, he's got other problems to face. And that's what I want to talk about for the remainder of our time together. I look at my clock and I can't believe I've been talking for 19 minutes and I've told you so very little. 
one of the one of the issues that um, John is going to have to deal with is the problem of a very powerful and formidable pope named Innocent the Third. Now the Crusades by this time aren't going very well. Um, Innocent is called the Fourth Crusade, and you all know how it goes. It's a terrible disaster, and uh, forever wrecking any potential relationship be reemerging between the Eastern and the Western churches. It, it um, discolored the character of the Crusades even further. This is, of course, the you know the uh, terrible Crusade where Constantinople is sacked, and you know Innocent can say all day, "I didn't tell you to do that. I told you not to do anything like that," and it's still laid at his feet, and perhaps rightly so. But Innocent is still very, very powerful. The Crusades are still considered a noble venture, and he has, this is very important for you to underline in your notes and for you all to understand, Innocent has, at the heart of his uh, concept of his role, is to bring European kings completely under the authority of the church, meaning himself. Oh, good luck with that. And in fact, it's going to boomerang on him and backfire for his successors, as you all know. Um, and it it's just not a good plan. And he is going to use John as um, a laboratory experiment to show what he means to do. And I have some really bad feelings about this, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in the lecture. But John has, at the heart of his problem, a vacancy in the archbishop of, and it's called an archbishopric. He, he is got a vacancy in the position of Canterbury which, of course, you know, is the most important bishop in England. The, the very capable Hubert Walter has died. And Hubert Walter has been a right arm to Richard, very dependable. He had had some positions like Longchamp as just this year. Good man, knows things. He, he, felt, he felt that Arthur would have been a better successor to Richard than John, but he's not one to fight the king, and he actually serves John well. John, being always the one to think the wrong thing at the wrong time, felt that you know he was he was relieved with the death of Hubert Walter, and he felt like you know he could be king instead of seeing Walter as someone that might try to advise him to do the right thing. He sees like, okay, good, now I can stay up as late as I want to at night. And he had that sort of mindset. But now the trouble begins. Let me give you just a little bit of background. And I hate to put you to sleep. My little black and white cat's over here sleeping. And I know that this has put him to sleep. But let me give you a little background. The selection of a bishop and the selection of an archbishop is a tricky matter. And it's supposed to be done by the monks of the chapter house are those that live within the cathedral's environs, but it's not done that way. And the idea is if they choose, they're going to choose someone that really the Pope approves of, it's going to be done right. Actually, it's the king in England that needs to be the one that they're worried about uh, approving their choice. But I, I can't, I don't know, I don't know, um, I should, I should make some notes about this. I don't know anything about this particular chapter house other than they, they made a bad decision. The monks choose a little squirrely guy. He's like, um, he's called in your textbook a sub-prior. This is someone who's like second in command and, um, of the cathedral, of, of the, 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 um, Second in command is really too generous. When you have a, a, a monastic chapter, whether they're in a cathedral or whether they're in a, a, a house somewhere, you have the abbot, you have um, a prior and a sub prior. So maybe a third in command would be the best, better way to describe it rather than second in command. But he's someone with some authority and to sort of oversee the smooth running of the chapter house or the monastery. Um, a cathedral is a monastery or a housing, a holy house that ho that has a bishop. That's what sets it apart from other holy houses. 
So you've got the archbishop here, you've got an abbot, a prior, and a subprior. And Reginald was the subprior, and um, he is sent, the monks send him, they say, okay, go, go to Rome, um, present yourself, um, and he will give you, the Pope will give you the, the pallium, the vestments, to show that, yeah, 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 you're the one, you're the archbishop, we approve, I approve this choice, go, don't tell anybody you're going, and to me, if you're, if you're having to go on a secret mission, you got to know that there's something wrong with you being the choice. And Reginald is told, you know, go quietly, go present yourself humbly. And then on the way, he, he goes at a snail's pace because he makes a great big deal. You know, he has an entourage with him. I'm the choice for the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm going to see the Pope, get my, my vestments, my pallium. It's me, I'm the man. Error in judgment. Wrong, 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 wrong. So when he gets there, the Pope says, no, you're not the choice. I have chosen someone else. And he presents his choice, who um, is a man named, um, I don't even, I don't even, um, yes, sorry, I know who it is, it's Stephen Langton, I don't know where my brain went, you just have to forgive me, and I'm not going to stop this video and start again, Stephen Langton, I am so sorry, class, the most important man of the era, I forgot his name, Stephen Langton, those of you who are interested at all in the evolution, and I shouldn't use that word, or how the English Bible came into being, Stephen Langton is a very interesting person for you to look at. So the Pope's choice is Stephen Langton. The king doesn't like Langton. He doesn't like Reginald. He has, in fact, his own choice. So here, here's, here's the scenario. The little squirrely little monks send Reginald. Reginald makes a disaster of it. Pope says, no, I have somebody else, Stephen Langton. So he informs the king in the chapter house, Stephen Langton is coming, who's an Englishman. He's a cardinal. He's in Rome then. He's the man. He's the man. He was actually a good choice. And then, and then John says, no, 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 no. I have somebody else, John de Grey, who is then the Bishop of Norwich. Well, he's probably, there's probably nothing wrong with him, but the Pope is saying, no, this is an excellent time for me to show who is the boss. I am the boss, and the king will submit to my choice. So, and in actuality, even though your professor couldn't remember his name, Langton is the man. He is a good choice. He is a wise choice, and he will outlive both um, of these men, both Innocent and um, King John, and he is, he is a good choice. But, John says, no, I'm not going to accept him, and you just have to deal with that. Well, error. The Pope will issue what's called an interdict. Um, I-N-T-E-R-D-I-C-T. And I think this is one prime example of how the papacy oversteps its boundaries and if you'll forgive me for saying, it's a prime example of the faultiness of the theology of the Roman church. And you know I don't like to say things like that, but it really does show you clearly here the problem. An interdict simply suspended your relationship with Christ. It, it made, um, the Pope gave the order to all English churchmen that the sacraments were not to be offered, and I'm probably not saying that 100% correctly. You couldn't have mass. I don't think you were allowed to have weddings. Um, all of that was suspended. Now, this is a perfect time for us to talk about this. 
you and I may not be able to go to church. The governor has suspended um, gatherings of 10 or more unless you can prove that you can be six feet away. Well, our church body is a small, it's a small church physically and in terms of the number of people there, but we're not 100% sure that we, we will always stay six feet apart or there might not be some contagion that's brought into the church. So we have agreed to comply to protect our members. But we can still pray, we can still talk, we can still ask God for forgiveness. Um, probably a marriage could still be performed. I would say that, that there's probably some provision for that if that were necessary. And again, most importantly, our relationship with the Lord Jesus is not interrupted. The Pope, because he was angry with the king and because he was trying to prove that the king was subject to his authority, effectively denies salvation to the people of England by saying, he tells his clergy, if you perform the mass, if you perform weddings, if you do this list of, of things, then, then you are excommunicated. That's even scarier because that's that's dooming you to hell. So I'm I'm saying this Pope is really, really overreaching his role as a man of God for political purposes. And he's fooling himself thinking that, you know, he's that this is what he's supposed to do, and he's not. I want you to think about what this meant for what this meant for um King John and for his people and I think it takes I think it I think the memory of this kind of behavior makes it easier for England down the road a few centuries to accept Henry's separation from the Bishop of Rome as what he called the papacy so um, when we come back when we come back on our next lecture I'm going to pick up with this discussion a little bit, and then we're going to go, we're going to look at John's problems at home um, that are going to come um, towards the end of his reign. So thank you for your good attention, and I will see you on the next lecture. Talk to you later. Bye.